Sugar certainly gets a bad rap, and not without cause. Eating too much sugar is clearly connected to being overweight and obese. After all, sugar that doesn't get burned off is stored as fat in the body, and excess storage can leave you overweight or obese. You're then placed at higher risk of a string of nasty scenarios like heart disease. For these reasons, I was a little surprised when Dr. Russell Blaylock began highlighting our inescapable need for sugar as glucose when I invited him on to talk about sugar and the brain. And Dr. Blaylock would certainly know what it takes to keep a brain working in top condition. He's a board-certified neurosurgeon of more than 25 years experience, alongside which he also ran a nutritional practice. Today, he highlights sugar in its helpful and harmful forms and what's needed to have sugar used as nature intended by our bodies. Welcome to Vital Science, where we learn how to get healthier from all angles, from the biochemical and nutritional to the things we do that nourish our minds and our souls. I'm Brendan Fallon. Dr. Blaylock, great to have you join us on Vital Signs again. Thank you, I appreciate it. You author the Blaylock Wellness Report, which has a strong focus on nutrition, the things we should be putting into our bodies, the things we shouldn't be putting into our bodies. Now, sugar has had a lot of attention over the years for its potential damaging effect on the brain. How do you see sugar fitting into brain function? Sugar, which uh, for the brain is glucose, uh, it's a simple sugar. It's the number one fuel for the, the nervous system, particularly the brain is bionicle. And we can't do without it generally. Now, ketones, which are a very short carbon unit fatty acid, can take up 50% of the energy production of the brain. But glucose is its number one production. Uh, during glucose metabolism, the brain produces lactic acid and it uses the lactic acid for energy. So if you're glucose deficient, if you don't have glucose, and this happens in hypoglycemia, people pass out. They have seizures. Uh, if it's chronic, if their brain is unable to absorb the sugar, uh, the glucose, uh, from their blood, which is insulin resistance, they become demented. Uh, they be develop neurodegenerative uh, diseases because the brain loses its nutrition. It's no longer able to. How does the insulin affect the, the glucose going into the cells? Well, generally, glucose won't go into a cell without insulin. That's what happens to diabetics. Is their glucose won't enter the cell, so their blood glucose goes way up. Despite all of this glucose circulating, none of it goes in the cell. So to the cell, it's like it's starving. Uh, it says, I'm not getting any glucose. And so your blood sugar shows, well, you've got tons of glucose, but none of it's getting in the cell. This is especially a problem in the brain. And you can have low blood sugar in the brain, which I call isolated hypoglycemia. And so you act just like your, your brain is starving. And when your brain starves, you start having neurological problem, neurodegeneration. And the cell eventually will, will shrivel up and die. Now, people get on a, a ketone diet, which is very difficult, and, and that, that'll keep them from getting severe brain damage. And it can take over a lot of metabolism in the place of glucose. The advantage uh, is that the uh, ketones do not need insulin. And uh, in the brain, we think, at least some people thought, that you don't need insulin in brain cells. It can absorb the glucose. Well, there's a special transport protein called GLUT, and there's eight different types. There's so one through eight. And the brain has GLUT three and four, and it works with insulin to push the glucose inside of brain cells and what we call glia cells. And uh, that keeps the brain functioning normally. Some are thought to have this transport protein, these GLUT three, four, deficient in the brain and so the glucose won't go into the cell it's just floating around outside of the cell so if glucose or ketones either of these energy sources can get into the brain cells that can prevent the brain starving that's right and and degenerating that's right and we found that people's memory improves if you give them glucose for instance you could take alzheimer's patients and give them a drink with glucose in it and their memory gets better temporarily then after it wears out, they deteriorate. We found that if uh, you feed them ketones, particularly the uh, short ketones like acetic acid or 
beta-hydroxybutyric acid, uh, they get better. Uh, they have better memory, uh, better emotional control. So many of these diseases are because the brain cannot produce enough energy. And we call them mitochondrial diseases because most of the energy in your cells, particularly brain cells, are produced by mitochondria. And as you age, the mitochondria ages as well. And it has difficulty carrying out its normal functions without the energy. The brain is the most energy utilizing organ in the body. Over 20% of the glucose in the body is utilized by the brain, even though the brain's only five pounds. So uh, you have a, a relatively small organ compared to your whole body, yet it's using most of the glucose. People that skip breakfast, they're in trouble. <laughs> they can't remember as well as kids who eat breakfast because they start to form glucose. Now you have different ways of your body to make glucose. You store glucose in the form of glycogen. That breaks down very quickly and it can keep your brain alive for a while, but then you run out of it and you become hypoglycemic. Uh, proteins can convert somewhat into uh, glucose called gluconeogenesis. That's very slow. So you can get on an all protein diet. Well, you might do all right, but you're working on the edge. And, and if, if anything happens, you go quickly. Earlier, you were talking about specifically getting the ketones as a way to avert brain damage. What, that sounds like a very severe situation. I mean, what circumstance would someone be facing brain damage due to lack of that energy from glucose or ketones that giving them ketones would avert? Well, for instance, with diabetes, like I said, insulin resistance is that you have all this glucose in, in your brain, but none of it's getting in the cells. So as far as the cells is concerned, it's starving. So what you have to do is improve insulin function and a number of nutrients uh, will drastically improve insulin function and overcome insulin resistance. So that's the role of nutrition. Now, the problem with physicians, even uh, when I was a neurosurgery resident and, and working with neurologists, is that they didn't understand this. They knew absolutely uh, very little about brain nutrition and brain function. All my patients, I would give uh, vitamins, uh, trace elements to, and the nurses all said, you know, your patients do a lot better than everybody else. We would see patients who just in terrible condition, recover, go home. And that was not happening to the other residents because they, they weren't giving any of these things. And what the, the nutrition has, has demonstrated in this is that if the brain is injured, for instance, an auto accident or a burn or whatever, Nutritional depletion occurs within 24 hours. You have almost no vitamin C. Slowly, these other vitamins disappear. Your B vitamins disappear very quickly. They're all water soluble. Your vitamin D and the other things, it's a little bit slower. It takes a couple of weeks, a couple of months. But we would see patients who would be in a coma for months being fed uh, just sugar water. They got no vitamins. Uh, what we find is if, if you uh, take a patient that's uh, in that condition and give glucose to them without the vitamins, particularly vitamin B1, thiamine, it'll destroy the cells, particularly cells in the brain, particularly the hippocampus, which has to do with memory and emotional control. So these things are very important. You've got to understand the biochemistry of the brain called neurochemistry. I'm sad to say most physicians don't have any background, any, in, in nutrition of the brain. And so they think giving patients vitamins is, is silly. They think it's, it's, it's a health food store. No, it's tons and tons of well-done study and literature that shows this works. And why? And the mechanisms. And that the brain is highly dependent on nutrition highly dependent because it's one of the most metabolic uh, systems in the body. When you take a, a person and you put them under anesthesia, the brain is absorbing enormous amounts of nutrient, even though you think they're, they're asleep. And when a person is asleep, or if, if you try to induce a coma, we used to use a barbiturate coma, and you put them deep, deep, deep in a coma, they didn't move a muscle. Their brain was metabolizing like crazy. 
So people don't understand what happens with these things. If you get in an injury, uh, just a head injury, nothing, no bones are broken or anything, uh, the brain energy deficit is equal to a third degree burn. And people don't realize the need during injury, during burns, during these, these conditions for increased nutrition. 